It is a great day to be here watching this video with you. I don't know where you are online. If you are, welcome. And if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, you know the drill, right? We need you to like, we need you to subscribe, get notifications, and would you share this information mm. if it has really been meaningful to you? I know Armed and Dangerous for me has been like a lot of thinking, lots of furious note taking, and I hope that you're there too. What's happening this week? Well, hopefully we're bringing uh, a lot more value in some in some areas, but what we're looking at this week kind of has to do with something I think that affects us all, but sometimes we really don't know how we're being affected. And I so my question for you, and when I'll ask Claudia later, so get ready, Claudia, is do you believe something that has been incorrect that has proven to be detrimental. And for me, there was a whole lifestyle. There were some things that I believed about reality and eternity concerning my worldview that were just wrong. And the problem was I kept stumbling in life and I couldn't really figure out why. It's like, it's like you walk into a room and the lights are off and you walk around that room and you trip over and over and over. If the lights never come on, it doesn't matter if you rearrange the furniture, it doesn't matter how, how well you look, you're gonna trip over things and you're not gonna know why. And that's why what we believe is so important. Do you have any experiences where you believe something that wasn't true and it, it was detrimental to you? I don't think I can give you a concrete example, but I can tell you underlying in my life, I would say, I'm acting a certain way. This way is not helping me. I'm not achieving. I'm not, I don't have good direction. I'm fearful. A lot of things, a lot of things that I recognize as not good or healthy. And then I realize that underneath of all of that, I'm believing something that's not true. And then I start exploring and I find out what is true. And subsequently, my behavior or my belief or my anxiety will change. The reason that is, and you've probably experienced something similar, I've experienced that our belief, what we really believe, not what we say we believe, but what we really believe ultimately determines how we behave. So if you look at a person's behavior, regardless, again, regardless of what they say they believe, you can see what they really believe. So your behavior, your, the repetitiveness Will, will, will concrete or cement the reality of the beliefs in, in real life. And unfortunately... You gotta get them out of concrete. Yeah, well, it is kind of hard to change. <laughs> it is hard. And, and it's really hard sometimes when, when those things are causing pain to other people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And not only do we look at the hurt and the conflict that it causes in our lives, it, it, it does affect those around us. And, and that's why we're talking about what we're talking about today. Doctrine, what you believe, all of these things, they really, really matter and are affecting us more than we believe. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's all encompassing, so you need to stay tuned. You've got some great information coming for us today. Wherever you're watching or listening, you're going to get some great, good truths to stick inside to mull over for this week. Hopefully, you'll be back next week and get some more. So with that, we're going to turn you over to worship, and we'll see you next time.
offering you water baptism. If you have already answered the call of God and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I would invite you to come over to my left, your right, to the blue sign, and there you'll find some men that will be willing to talk you through the process. If you have not accepted Jesus, I ask you to consider this. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his only son to accept the penalty for your sin. It doesn't matter how far you've run. It doesn't matter where you've tried to hide. It is never too late to call on Jesus. So continue to worship.
set foot in our church or in the church before. There'll be people who are coming back after long sabbaticals. I want to encourage you to consider being a part of making a difference in those folks' lives. If you have time, if you would consider, please volunteer for our Easter services on Easter Sunday. We need all the help we can get. It's one of those things where it's all hands on deck. I want you to, to be a part of making a difference in the lives of those who hear the gospel message. You'll be a part of the transformation that occurs in their lives. On the front end, I want to go ahead and say thank you for those who have signed up and for all of you that will sign up to, to make this a memorable experience. God bless you. Again, don't forget to sign up very soon to volunteer for all of our services on Easter Sunday. God bless you. Rockfish Church, here's what's brewing. Rockfish Church is dedicated to creating connectivity and community through digital engagement. In an effort to simplify access to information, we invite you to scan the RFC Connect QR code. This easy step enhances your connection with the Rockfish Church community, giving you immediate access to events and other important information. Get connected with Rockfish Church today. Discover Starting Point at Rockfish Church, a concise four-session series held every Sunday at 12.10 p.m. This introductory class reveals the church's mission, values, beliefs, and opportunities for engagement, ideal for anyone new to Rockfish or seeking a deeper connection. Embark on a journey of spiritual growth and fellowship this Sunday. Childcare is provided, and you are welcome to start anytime. Well, that's all we have today for you guys. See you next week. Good morning, Rockfish Church. So my name is Chris, and I'm one of the elders here. And Rockfish Church and all of God's churches are known to be houses of prayer. This morning, we've got a young man who I think every one of you know, every one of you, for the most part, get to see him every Sunday, who's getting ready to deploy. So Abe, come on up. Can I get my leaders and anyone who loves this man? I'll get you guys to come up as well. Abe, can you tell us what's going on? Yep, so I'll be heading out for a long tour down to South America. Um, it's never easy to leave family behind and go off on this trip, but I have laid down everything to God's hands, and I asked him to use me, let me be that vessel that he needs me wherever he sends me, and I appreciate everything that Rockfish Church has done to equip me, and now I'm being released, and I just... I'm just excited to see what God is going to do through me. Awesome. These people gathering. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for my brother. We thank you for Abe. We thank you for who he is and the impact he is having on your kingdom, Father. Lord, as he goes, your word says, blessed are the peacemakers. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's going to make peace. So, Father, we ask that he goes in your blessing. Father, I, take, I ask that you go with him, guard and protect him while he's gone. Father, put, put brothers and sisters around him who will keep him close and especially keep him close to you, Father. If he ever tries to step away, if things pull him away from you, Father, may they help pull him back to you. Father, we ask that you would pull him back to you. Whatever the situation is, keep him close to you, Father. Protect him, Lord. Return him home safely. Father, most importantly, while he is there, use him, Lord. 
to advance your kingdom. May more people know about your love through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now you can have the mic. Hello, Rockfish Church. Hello, Rockfish Kids. Amen, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first time here at Rockfish Church, and you have kids with you. Welcome. We love having you here today. But in order to get into our kids' ministry, you're going to need a sticker. Why I need that sticker is because we love our kids so much. We're going to do everything to keep them safe, keep them secure, teach them about Jesus Christ. And most importantly, we want to give them back to the correct parent. Also, anytime during the service, uh, in the back of the screen, in a red banner, that same correlator may appear. If it matches yours, that means your child needs you. To do that, go out the double doors to one of the kiosks, print out, the, uh, print out your sticker, place it nice and high like I do so it's easy for our lifeguards to see. If you can't print out a sticker, go to the kids' ministry table, register your kids. They'll print out the sticker for you, and then for future services, you will be able to print them out. All of our classes are available, so nursery, all the way to fifth grade, you're released to go to your classrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not forget your kids after the service. Let's continue to worship. God bless.
you know, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but uh, you know it's St. Patrick's Day, right? I got on my green. So I asked them to do green lights so y'all could all have on green so nobody got pinched here in the dark and nobody got it. I'm kidding, but the green lights are a good touch. God is great and he is worthy to be praised. And we can withhold that acknowledgement and the culture and the world can withhold that acknowledgement. But there comes a point where creation itself, the rocks will cry out in our stead if necessary. Welcome, let's pray. Father, great are you, Lord. God, we thank you for the air that is in our lungs. Let us use it not to curse man, but to praise God. Let us use our words, Father God, not to tear down and destroy, but to, to build you up in appreciation and adoration for everything that you are, God, today, this morning, today we say thank you, Father, in the name of the Son. Holy Spirit, the living God, you are our teacher, you are our guide. Jesus, you went away so the Holy Spirit could come and be with us every step of the way. Holy Spirit, today guide us, open the eyes of our understanding, open our hearts, destroy deception. And allow us to see you as you are in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you if you are joining us online or at one of our Rockfish Church gatherings. Thank you so much for being here. We are on part seven. That's right. Part seven of a sermon series entitled Armed and Dangerous. You know, as a, as a pastor here at, at Rockfish and as a part of the leadership, I feel that it is incredibly important for us to be prepared to fortify ourselves against deception and those things that are, that are common when it comes to deception in, in the world. That's why this series, Jesus said that in the last days there would be tremendous deception and a lot of people would fall for that deception. And again, I feel it's our obligation and my honor and privilege and, and need to prepare for deception. This series, Armed and Dangerous, we've looked at, at some aspects of science and biology and geology and a lot of those things that maybe we don't talk about very often in the church. If you have missed any of those, please. We began by asking the question, is God and science incompatible or is it is it compatible? We answered those questions and many, many more today. I want to talk about some other questions and some other issues in a different context. Okay, we're going to move into destructive doctrine, dogma, and deception in the context of Christianity, in the context of understanding who and how God is. In fact, we're going to start by, by looking at the person of Jesus Christ. We're going to start by answering some common questions or accusations concerning God. And then I want to jump into fortifying you, and this is important, 
fortifying you by functionally helping you see the real and recognize the real thing. Eric's going to follow up with this next week, and it's going to be it's going to be really good. Excited about that. But we're going to look at the character of God as revealed within the Word of God that will help us see through deception. In other words, we're going to see what the Bible says about who and how God is. That way, when we hear something that's inconsistent with his character, we'll be able to recognize that very, very quickly. I've got a lot of content and a lot of information, so please get your notes ready, whether you're keeping uh, notes on the online app or on the app or on a notebook. Let's jump right into this. So I want to talk about some common objections to God. Now, last Wednesday night, we went through about five of them. Some of these are going to be similar. I want to talk, uh, several of them I'm going to go over again because many of you may have missed that. Please check it out online. And then we're going to go over some other ones because I want us to really hear this in totality as a congregation. So, the problem of evil. And here is the argument. Many of you have probably heard this argument, but you need an answer. The answer first we need to apply to ourselves. We need to, we need to be okay. We need to understand what we believe before we ever try to address this with other people. This was a question that I had to answer before I came to God. I, I, I trusted and faith helped me a lot, but understanding really, really compounded my hope in, in God and his word. The problem of evil, if God is all powerful, all knowing, and all good, why does evil exist? The presence of suffering and evil in the world is often cited as inconsistent with the concept of a benevolent and all-powerful, omnipotent deity. And, and I, I don't want to get too complicated, I want to, but I also don't want to be too simplistic. I don't want to blow this off, but I think it is a very simple Christian answer. I think that the worldview that the Bible offers gives us a, a succinct uh, reason for why we see the brokenness and the wickedness in, he, in the earth, and it's, it's not evidence against God. It's actually validity that proves there is a God. Stay with me for just a moment. God gave Adam, according to the scripture, real authority. Now, now I heard somebody ask this question recently, and I thought it was interesting. They said, could not, could not a sovereign God grant sovereignty in the form of free will to humanity? Well, the answer, of course, is a sovereign God. He could do anything he wanted to do, right? He can, he can give us a real choice. He can give us a real opportunity. And along with that, he can give us real consequences. And that is exactly what the Bible says he did. He gave Adam real authority, and he relinquished real authority in this real world. And there are real consequences as a result of the real decisions that he made. All of us, according to the scripture, were in Adam. None of us. Every bit of the DNA that is in you right now was carried down through generations to find itself in you right now. His DNA was affected on day one when God said, if you do this, you will die. You will be eternally, or you will be, at least while you're here on the earth, you will be changed. Something will happen. I heard somebody say this. Think about it. I'm just going to throw this out there. This is free. Death is actually the the mercy of God. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, think about it. If, if we would never die, we would be living eternally in an irreconcilable state. But death is that, that partition that allows the penalty to be paid with the option of regeneration and the resurrection that Christ identified with exemplified and promised to us. So, so death was in essence an end to the damage that sin can do. And we look around and go, well, if there's a good God, why is there evil? Because we're the perpetuators of that evil. The very people who would say, well, there, if God is real, then why is there so much evil are the ones doing the evil. You understand that in creation, it's generally not just creation, it's humanity that is perpetuating the sin which results in the evil that humanity uses as an accusation to say there is no God. God is real and God is good. That does not mean that mankind is as well. It's a real consequences to real authority that a real man in space and time gave away. This one, how about the scientific explanation? The argument is that naturalistic explanations for the universe's origin, i.e. the big, e.g. the big 
Bang Theory evolution provide no empirical evidence or necessity for a divine creator. Well, there's one problem, huge problem with this. If you missed this portion of the series at the beginning, Answering the Atheist, please go back and take a look at this. We talked about a lot of the scientific evidences and, and addressed a lot of these um, a lot of these issues. But science offers descriptions not explanations. D did you hear that? Science offers a description of things that are going on in the world, not why things are in the world. It doesn't offer, it doesn't answer some of the greatest questions that are real questions, but no form of materialism can answer. Like what, Pastor Tony? Like the idea of origin and morality and purpose and destiny. None of those are answered by materialism. None of those are answered by naturalistic explanations. Science doesn't have an answer for those at all and never will. It can tell you everything about a rock, but it can't tell you why the rock is there. It can tell you everything about your body, but it can't tell you if it's moral to kill it or not. You understand, there are, there are certain things. And then when, when we look and say, well, the naturalistic explanations, the problem is that, that all of these theories, guess what? These theories are based on knowledge. Knowledge and data is constantly changing and increasing, but guess what's not changing? The theories that man is hanging on to. Very often there's empirical evidence and scientific evidence, but we, we don't like to change, especially when we've successfully indoctrinated people in the way that we desire. All right, so conflicting religions argument. Now this is an interesting one. The existence of numerous religions with conflicting doctrines about God suggests that human understanding of God is culturally constructed rather than based on divine truth. Well, 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 now hang on. If that's the case, there are a lot of different religions out there. I'm going to hit, hit a couple of on the uh, a couple of these. None of these, none of these, all of these say that that. Uh, a man and a woman should be married and they should be committed to each other, okay? They may disagree on how many, but none of them are okay with somebody running around with somebody else's wife. That's kind of universal. All of them understand and agree that death occurs, but none of them are okay with murder. So there are a tremendous amount of commonalities between all of the religions However, just because one is wrong or there may only be one that's right, does that in any way logically do away with the idea that there is a divine reality? Absolutely not. If you come to a different math conclusion than I come to, it just means that one of us is wrong. We see it and we apply it in, in everyday life, in every way. But our, our current culture doesn't want to tell anybody they're wrong because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The problem is, is when your religion is inconsistent with reality, somebody needs to start asking some questions. And that's why Christianity is so heavily examined. Culture reconstructs, and part of this is the problem, because culture reconstru culture's reconstruction of God leads to deception concerning God. And that's exactly what, what happens, is we allow culture to affect our idea of God, and, and, and we obscure what is divine truth or divine reality. In other words, when man begins to remake God in an image that is more palatable to us, it becomes a distorted God. And we see that in a lot of different ways. Man has always tended to reject truth when it's contrary to his culture. All right, so the problem of hell. Now, this is a particularly interesting one. The argument is that the concept of hell as eternal punishment for disbelief or sin is morally incompatible with the idea of a loving and just God. Can I tell you, if there's not punishment, there's not justice. Everybody in here says, well, I, I want to leverage this to get rid of the idea of God, but, but it's not convenient when, when a, tra a, a travesty is committed against me or my loved ones. I want to see that person burn. Do, do, do you see? And all of a sudden they go, well, my desire to see them burn is evidence that there's not God because they're evil. Well, well hang on. Let's back up. Our ignorance of the destructive nature of sinful behavior is evidence of how far we've fallen. Do you understand that, that this idea 
if there's, if there's evil in the world, it's because there's no good God. Do you understand that the evil is in the world because of the existence of humanity at which they point at the sin of humanity and say, well, there's punishment for that, so there can be no God. It's this, it's this failed logic. And, and what we see very often is a pattern of accusations against God to validate our rebellious behavior. Okay, we, we want to have our cake and kind of eat it too. So do you want a just and loving God? Well, we do as long as that just justness is pointed towards somebody else and the love is pointed towards us. Everybody in here would agree, you know what, Hitler needs, he needs to pay for what he did, right? And if he didn't, it would be considered unjust. And then there is another accusation against God. Can I tell you, that's what humanity has always done has always failed and lived with a way inconsistent with God's desire and sinned and inundated the world with the very negative consequences of that sin and then pointed their finger at God and blamed him. It's exactly what it says we do in the book of Proverbs. Problem of hell. I would have a real big problem with God being a God of love and justice if there was not a penalty for something as egregious as sin. Now, let me help you with this. The Bible says that hell was not created for you or for me. If you go to hell, you are a trespasser. If you are in hell, it's because you have rejected the provision that God has made and you've embraced the rebellious heart against God and you will suffer the just consequences of that rebellion. That's, a, that, that's good and solid. I can rest my feet on that. I can understand that if I'm in hell, I absolutely deserve to be there. And every one of us deserves to be there. If sin is as egregious as God says it is. So is sin as egregious as God says it is? Oh, but Pastor Tony, it's just a, little, just a little lie. Think about the ramifications of just little lies throughout the context of history. Little lies turn into the death of the unborn and our culture being complicit. Oh, it's not a baby. That's a lie. And it's cost 60 million lives. How dangerous is a lie? And to think that, it's, that this all started with something as innocent as a lie. Problem is God in his wisdom and his divine order of justice and loves understands exactly how detrimental sin is to humanity and he loves humanity. In fact, the justice of God demands one day that every single person gives an account and he puts an end to this foolishness in the context of his creation. So the divine hiddenness, the argument, if God exists, why isn't God's presence more obvious? The hiddenness of God is puzzling if God desires a relationship with humanity. You've, you've heard people say this. Well, if God is real, he should reveal himself to me. In fact, you've probably prayed at one time or the other, God, would you please reveal yourself to this person? Do, do you understand what, what Jesus was? Jesus was the revelation of God to humanity. Jesus was God in a flesh tent. Jesus was God on two feet, revealing himself to humanity. Humanity rejected him and all of the evidences that he presented for being who he was. Let me go a little further. When we talk about Christ as being Emmanuel or God with us. Not, not just from what he said, but from what he did. Do you understand that every religion in the world has, has had to come to a particular conclusion about Christ and who he was? They had to do something with him, not just because of what he said, not just because of what he taught, but what he did. Let, let me give you Ju Judaism, for example. Judaism never denied the miracles that Christ did. The Jews never said that he didn't heal the blind and cause the lame to walk and raise the dead. Only we now, only our historians and theologians question that. Let me explain something. They didn't question that because there were too many eyewitnesses and too many people knew the people who were experiencing these miracles and these amazing things. So what did they do? They twisted it. The Jews didn't say Jesus didn't do the miracles. They just said he did it through the power of Beelzebub. 
And Jesus said, well, if I'm healing people that the devil's making sick, that divides the kingdom, and that doesn't work. And if I cast out these demons by the, by the finger of God, who do your children do it? If I'm casting them out by the devil, who do your children cast them out? Because we're getting the same results. Is the kingdom divided? Is Satan divided against himself? You see, the, the, the point is, the person of Jesus Christ, the reality of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ was observable. And mankind did what? They saw the truth. They experienced the truth. And they did exactly what they do today. They rejected that truth. You remember a parable. A guy said, listen, he woke up in hell and he said, go and tell my brothers so that they don't come to this horrible place that I now know is real. And he said, listen, he said, if they don't believe Abraham and Isaac and Moses, if they don't believe history, time and space, if they don't believe the word of God, do you think they're going to believe somebody who comes back from the dead? Do, do you know they were plotting to kill Lazarus? Because he was the, the walking evidence of, of God's power in the person of Jesus Christ. We don't want to, to consider the evidence. You know what we do? We want to get rid of it. We, don't, we want to oppress it. Why? Because it says very clearly in the book of Romans that humanity desires darkness rather than light. We would rather, we would rather invalidate God in our minds, live with the consequences, than repent. I had said this before, and I've, I've fallen into this trap, and many of you may have fallen in before. Anytime somebody brings up some outlandish idea, we feel like we have to chase that little enigma down, come to the, come to the conclusion, and settle it for everybody to see. And as quickly as, they do, as we do that, they come up with another excuse. The Bible says people who are that way are twisted and sinning. C can I be honest? I think it's more important at this state of our culture to compel rather than convince. Now, I'm, I'm telling you these things, even in the context of this series, so that you can be convincing, so that you can share why you believe what you believe. But I'm telling you, the times are coming, and, and I believe are now, that we need to compel through the Word of God. God says this. This is the standard. And this is the consequence. Repent and be saved. People say, well, that sounds like turn and burn. Well, <laughs> that's kind of what Jesus said. <laughs> that was kind of his way of doing it, you know. I, I think that we have really kind of changed our, how we do the gospel and how we share the truth of the gospel. And we've lost an urgency. We've lost an urgency because we don't want to offend anybody. I promise you right now, there's nobody in hell who wished that they weren't more offended and weren't there right now. Common false teachings about Jesus. Now, now listen, I'm going to point out one in the context of Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? But I'm not picking on this particular one. I'm using them as an example of what they believe, and this is their doctrine, not mine, concerning the deity of Christ and the person of Christ, because two weeks ago we talked about how the evangelicals saw Christ. A vast, actually a majority of evangelicals agreed with the statement that Jesus Christ was the first and greatest creation of God. Guys, that's not biblical. Yet a large percentage of evangelicals who put their faith and hope and trust in Christ believe that. It becomes very, um, very theologically problematic if Christ was a creature, a creation. Okay, uh, but this is not anything new. All right, I want to go through some of these false teachings, and I'm going to do it in the context of the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine. And um, if you're a Jehovah's Witness here, I don't hate you. I'm not hating anybody. It's just we want to. I want to use this as an example to help us see that what you do with Jesus matters, and you need to know why you believe what you believe about Him. Are you ready? So don't don't go out of here and and and, and be nasty to people. Uh, just pray for him. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, that Jesus is God's son, but he is not God. A rejection of either humanity or the divinity of Jesus is something that is actually very common. It has been around for a moment, and we're going to talk about that. Jesus is God's son, but he's not God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is the son of God, but they strongly reject the doctrine of the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus is Almighty God or equal to the Father. 
Now, you need to hear that. Do you believe that Jesus is equal to the Father? If you do, you need to be able to tell me why. If you don't, you need to be able to tell me why, because it matters. Okay? And we're, we're going we're to go through and look at this, so don't, don't get mad at me just yet. Number two, Jesus, they, they believe that Jesus is a created being, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. Again, as we talked about, a lot of people believe this. The question is, is this true? Because we do understand that all of creation was created through Jesus. Okay? He is the author of creation. Now, there's some... some some reasons that that complicates things, but I won't, I'm not going to stop there. I want to say this. Jesus, here's what they believe. They believe that Jesus existed in heaven before his earthly life as Michael the archangel. Jesus did exist in heaven before his birth on earth, but he did. Well, let me tell you what they believe before I read the Bible to you. They teach that he is the word. Uh, referred to in John 1.1, 1, 1, and again that he was God's first creation. According to their belief, Michael was used by God to create all of the other things, but is not co-eternal or co-equal with God. And there's uh, something that, that you should know. Jehovah's Witnesses, again, were not the first to come up with this. Many folks have been tripped up here. And there may be even people here today who aren't sure or don't understand, you know, this. There is tons of scripture. Um, Arius was the first one. Here's what I want you to understand. Where did this come from? How long has it been around? How has the church dealt with this particular heresy? I'm saying heresy because it is a deviation from doctrinal truth. Anything that's what heresy is. It's something that's just not true concerning the Word of God. So, so, so I want us to understand where it came from, when it came, and why so many people fall for it. But something that you should know, again, they were not the first. There was a gentleman, a man named Arius from 256 to 336 AD. He was the first formal challenger to the idea of the deity of Christ, but this was not until 300 years, actually almost 300 years after the crucifixion. So the deity of Christ was, was not, a, not something that was in common objection. If you look at the writings of the, of the early church fathers, it was something that was assumed. I heard, I heard a uh, historian, a, a scholar say, well, you know, John chapter 1 where he says, in the beginning was God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He wasn't talking about God being deity because that idea didn't come around till 300 years later. No, 300 years later is when the idea was squelched. It wasn't even formally presented until 300 years later. So you got to be careful what you're hearing. And first, your first flag when it comes to somebody teaching the Bible as a scholar of the Bible, if they're not a believer, there is a presupposition or multiple presuppositions that they are applying. Most scholars will tell you immediately that the Word of God is not divinely inspired. If it's not, we're wasting our stinking time here. You do understand this. So I say, what evidence of that that do you have? Well, we can see how the culture manipulated the Word of God throughout time. No, 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 no. That's how you say the culture manipulated the word. They don't believe that the word is inspired. They don't believe that the word contains any prophetic utterances. Yet we see Jesus referring to prophetic utterances. So you'll have to excuse me if today's modern liberal theologies, the, theologians and historians and, and these smart guys, I don't take their word over Jesus's, okay? So listen, I need you to catch this. Just because somebody speaks very well and uses a lot of fancy words and says the Bible, Bible doesn't really say what it's saying, please don't fall for it, okay? Please research it because there's just as smart people saying something very different about the same text. But the Bible says in the last days, they are going to heap to themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Guys, we are living this. If you want to stay in a, in a place of opposition with God, and retain a behavior that the Bible says is contrary to God, you have to validate it somehow. I'm going, well, if you don't believe in God, why would you bother in the first place? I mean, why would I become a Bible scholar if I didn't believe in the validity of the Bible? I'm just, I'm just saying. So I could disprove it? 
So Christ had been worshipped as God in flesh throughout church history to that point. And we're talking about till Arius comes along. Uh, which again was almost 300 years later. As, as we noted a few weeks back, this was even acknowledged by extra biblical writers. There was a, a writer early on, and I, I, I cited his name a couple of weeks ago, who witnessed and attributed the deity of Christ to the worship of the Christians. He said, this sect that follows this Christ worship this man as God. We have secular people very early on, immediately after the resurrection, writing about the oddity of Christians worshiping Jesus as God. John, the author of the book of John, worshiped Jesus. He calms the storm and they fell down and worshiped him. Jesus didn't stop him, but that's, that's speculative, right? Those, that's all... Uh, a different kind of evidence. Christ, again, had been worshipped up to that point. But uh, Arianism taught that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was created by God the Father and therefore was not co-equal with the Father. Now, the Council of Nicaea occurred in 325. Do research on this and don't just Google it because the first 10 that come up are going to be right there along with uh, liberal theologians all over because whoever says it long enough and loud enough is usually what people believe. But the council ultimately rejected Arius' teaching and affirmed the deity of Christ. Why? Why did these guys kick out this heresy and say, I mean, we need to know, right? You want to know that? Was it just uh, Augustine or somebody else come and, and just manipulated that council and, and, and came up with all this stuff like most of the YouTube videos will tell you? Or did they actually have good reason? Let, let's see why they squelched this heresy that arose 300 years after people had been following Christ as God in the flesh, okay? The Council of, of Nicaea rejected the teaching uh, and st that stated that he was of... Hey, the council ultimately rejected Arius' teaching and affirmed the deity of Christ, stating that he was of the same essence as the Father. This affirmation was encapsulated in the Nicaean Creed, which became the foundational statement of Christian orthodoxy. Why? That sounds good. I get that. But somebody manipulated the system. Why? The Nicene Creed declared that Jesus Christ as begotten. Remember when he said the only begotten son of God? The, the word begotten is really what made up their minds. It's really what kind of shifted the balance there because it kind of matters. Begotten, not made, being of the one substance of the Father, and thus affirmed his deity and co-eternal existence with the Father. See, that word begotten there doesn't mean born. It's a compound word, meaning only, the first part, meaning only or soul or singular. The second one, the second word means kind or type. It basically says his only, the standalone unique class which is Jesus Christ above all else and different from all else. Meaning a different kind, a different class, unique, one of a kind, or only. So that can be confusing, but can I read something to you that's really not confusing? You're going to write the scripture down, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Go ahead and just, just, just jot that down somewhere. Who, and this, this is speaking of Jesus. And, and read the text any way you want to. Look at what's before and what I'm going to go over how to do this so you're not duped. Who being in very nature God. Okay? So we see here that in the book of Philippians it says that the nature on the inside of Christ was God. Oh, hang on, Pastor Tony. That, that sounds kind of vague. Hang on. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God... Something to be used for his own advantage. So we see that Christ shared the nature of God and considered himself at least equal with God. Do you see the problem here? This is pretty clear. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Don't listen to what anybody tells you. When he says Emmanuel, it means God with us. It means just that. It means God with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Because this is important. Because who you say Jesus is, it really matters. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Do you understand that Jesus was a part of that, not as a created being? Can you give away something that you don't have? Let me just ask you, logically, can you give something you don't have? (laughs) Hey, can I have a cup of coffee? Not if you don't have one. (laughs) Sorry. All right. Anyway, with Jesus in the beginning, when we learn in the book of Hebrews, he created all things. He is the creator. Generally, created beings don't have that kind of power. I'm just throwing that out there. Because we're creative beings, and guess what? We don't have that kind of creative power. Anyway, there's two problems, and I said this before, and I want, I want everybody to kind of catch this. Two huge problems. One, and this is shared between Christians and atheists. One, and I don't, it, it seems to be universal. Not knowing what the Bible says is a huge problem. Huge problem. Number two, knowing something about the Bible that isn't true. And that's what we run into. There's so many people who know so much about the Bible that isn't true. The filters through which people interpret the text is incredibly important. When I'm interpreting the text of the Bible through, through extra biblical historical records while invalidating the text itself, do you understand how problematic that is? You understand? I mean, that becomes somewhat, it's like, I'm going to believe everything that all of these writings say about this historical writing, but I'm not going to consider that the historical writing may be true. There, there you go. There's your, there's your biblical scholars. There's your biblical scholars. They base their conclusions of the Word of God based on, on evidence that is interpreted today. You, 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 you can't do that. I mean, you can try to do that, and you can come up with a lot, a lot, of, a lot of nice theories, but that's generally not the way it works. It's, it's not logical, yet we do that, or yet people do that or have a way of doing that all the time. I'm not sure which is worse, not knowing the Bible or knowing stuff about the Bible that's not true. God helps those who help himself. You understand that's not in there. <laughs> it, does say without, it does say faith without works is dead. So that, that's, that, that can almost justify it. Anyway, so here's the part that I want to give to you as a weapon. Here's, a, here's what will arm you to deal with heresy. Here's what will arm you and help you understand the, the Word of God, uh, the biblical lens of God's character. Now, before we do this, I want to give you some rules of engagement with the text. This is how you study and how you should consider reading the Word of God. One, what is the text saying? Because the text is not subjective and it is not negotiable. How many of you have ever sent an email to anybody and wanted them to interpret it according to how they wanted it interpreted? No. You meant what you said in the email. Now, did they misunderstand? How many have sent a text and somebody misunderstood what you meant in the text? That's why you don't text. You can't, hear the, you can't hear the voice. You can't hear those things. People can make accusations about the text, and that's exactly what we see, unless they know you. But if they know that I'm sending the text, and you know me, and I say something off the wall, you go, yeah, that's Tony. Yeah, he's, he's being sarcastic. But if you don't know me, you may get offended. Okay, And this is why we need to know the author of the text, because if it is truly inspired by the Spirit of God, there's going to be consistencies. But what is the text saying? It is not negotiable. You don't look at it and read into it from your cultural perspective. You don't take out of it something from your cultural perspective. The author had an intention. You say, well, can you show me that in the Word? Yes. Peter said, referring to Paul, Paul writes some very difficult stuff to understand. And ignorant and unlearned and scrupulous people twist that into something it was never intended to be. Guys, you understand God said what he meant. He meant what he said. It's just sometimes we don't get it right. Does that, does, does that make sense? That's why he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. So we need to ask some questions. What is the context of the text that I'm reading? Is it descriptive or is it instructive? This is one of the greatest pieces of, pieces of advice that I ever received as a young believer. Is the text descriptive of what's going on or is it telling me that I should behave this way? 
See, very often people will look and go, well, God did all of this stuff, and it was descriptive, but it's, it doesn't tell the motivation. It doesn't say why. People go, well, God went in and he destroyed all these innocent Canaanites. Well, hang on. They weren't innocent, okay? Their evil had reached its pinnacle. God had dealt patiently with them for an entire generation. They were killing their own babies. They were sacrificing to demon entities. They were not sweet people. Judgment had reached its fulfillment. It was time to stop the foolishness. And that can happen anywhere in any nation and is considered just. There come a point where America had to get involved and stop what Hitler was doing, right? There came a point where somebody had to die to stop the foolishness that was going on. All right. What is the context? Is it descriptive or instructive? Is it conditional or is it universal? Are there, are there, is salvation? God died for the sins of the whole world. That means everybody saved, right? <laughs> is it conditional? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe, put their faith, trust, and hope in that thing would be saved. Is that conditional? Absolutely. Can you hear it and reject it? Anybody ever listened to, anybody ever sat in a classroom and heard the teacher say something and you chose not to believe it? Or you chose not to learn it, especially in math class. But you got a test later on. And the test showed that you rejected that knowledge. Is that the teacher's fault? If you're a homeschooler, you would say yes, because it's your parents. But the reality is, it's not the teacher's fault. Over and over, God reached out to Israel. He said, I would have gathered you. I extended my mercy over and over. But you stiff-necked people, you rejected it. Was God making them reject it? Did God not really mean that he, he had mercy and compassion and wanted them to repent? He does, and he deals with them and us patiently, but there comes a point. And we'll, we'll hit that in just a moment. Anyway, is it conditional? Is it universal? Well, what is the implication? How and to whom does it apply? Are the implications being placed upon the surrounding text or the circumstances? Is the Bible talking about right then, right there, or is this something that applies to all of us? Application. Again, does it, how do I apply this? Does it apply to me? What adjustments need to be made in my thinking, my attitude, my behavior? How do I live the adjustments? So you look at the Word of God. You adjust yourself to it. You don't twist it into something that suits your current position. That's called deception. Anyway, so let's look at some unchanging characteristics of God that will become the interpretive lens of God's work, allowing us to develop and recognize healthy doctrine and deceptive doctrine. So I'm going to tell you what God is. We're going to look at his character. You're going to see it. And when you hear or see something that is contradictory to his character, a red flag should go up. Okay, so you're about to get, you're about to get a weapon, a tool. A, a synthesizer that allows you to know, just like having a really good, and the more you know God, the more you're able to, to know about him and recognize what's not of him. Eric is going to really go into this next week, and we're going to dig a lot deeper. So 1 John 4, 7 and 9 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Love comes from where? From God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So, we, we see that one of the defining characteristics of God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only unique son into the world that we might live through him. So we understand that, that, that life comes only through the person of Jesus Christ, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the defining characteristic here of love in the context of God. God is love. God has demonstrated his love, which means his love is always active and measurable and visible. And God expects us to recognize and show love. Here's the problem. We run the definition of love through a current cultural context. The current cultural context of love is my measure of acceptance of somebody else. If I love you, I will accept you even if it's to your detriment. Here's the problem. The definition of love as defined in 1 Corinthians 13 says love never rejoices at unrighteousness. 
So if somebody is living in unrighteousness and you are affirming that unrighteousness, you are by functional definition of love in the Bible, not loving. Love is corrective on the base of well-being. Now, now we don't see that in our culture. If you love me, you would validate me where I am. No, no. I said I was not going to say shut up anymore up here and some other stuff that I shouldn't say. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit just gets me and goes, Tony. Anyway, stop it. When God says he is love, it's clearly defined in 1 Corinthians 13. And love is not some milk toast, watered down version of what we think it is. God defines the language, not man. Why? Because the consequences are not subject to our definition, but his. Psalms 56. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness. So God is love. God is righteous. For he is a God of justice. This is very convenient, very good if you're just. If you're not, it is very inconvenient. Psalms 116, 5 says, the Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. He's overflowing with compassion. But that's not very often the picture that is painted when we hear the accusations against God. How can a good God fill in the blank? But these are the true attributes. So we understand that God is righteous, God is just, God is gracious, and God is compassionate. Now, now why do I say that? Because it's very inviting for me to know this God. Which one of those, his righteousness, his justice, his graciousness, or his compassion, which one of those repel us? All of those actually are very inviting, right? Right? In fact, they're, they're what we all would say we wanted. Those are the biblically defined characteristics of the God that we serve. How about this one? As for God, his way is perfect. So, so, so his behaviors, what he does and how he does it is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. You know, I was listening to a, uh, I was listening to a uh, smart guy. And he was talking about a scholar of the Bible. And he said, nowhere does the Bible say that the Bible is without flaw. It's hard to put that on a TikTok video. Anyway, his... <laughs> As for God, his way is perfect and the Lord's word is flawless, but what people say about it may not be. He shields all who take refuge in him. Is that consequential or, or, or is that circumstantial? Yeah, it is. Does that mean you have a choice? Yeah, all who take refuge in him. Those who don't aren't shielded. Psalm 68, 20. Our God is a God who saves from the from the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. So these are, these are attributes. These are huge. You just need to understand what these are. His ways are perfect. His word is flawless. And God is sovereign. Now let me tell you what sovereignty means before you get all confused. That means God can do anything he wants to do, right? So let's go back to that first argument. Can a sovereign God grant sovereignty to somebody he desires to have sovereignty? For the sake of responsibility, absolutely. There's nothing inconsistent there. Nothing inconsistent. God can give you full power and still give you full consequences for how you use that power. So God's ways are perfect. His words are flawless. And he is sovereign. Now think about that. That means he chooses these things. It means nobody told him he had to be love. Nobody told him he had to be good or righteous or just. Nobody told him that. He alone has said, I will be because that is right. And every one of us, you know, there's a lot of religions that have a lot of different ideas about God and who he is and how he is. And they come up with a bunch of messed up ideas. But as I look at the person of Jesus, my soul screams, he has to be this way. He has to be just and compassionate and merciful and all of those things or he wouldn't be great. And he wouldn't be worthy. People go, what kind of narcissistic God demands that, that you worship him? <laughs> His attributes demand that I worship him. His perfectness, his complete love, 
His mercy and benevolence in creating me in the first place demand that I worship him. And as I recognize him, I do. How about this one? God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. So several things there. One, we see he's true. He's incapable. He doesn't lie. He's not tricking or manipulating anybody. And we see he doesn't change his mind. Now, that does not mean that it is a contradiction where it says, come, let us reason together. Think about that. Do, do, do you see? Just because God, God repents over Sending destruction doesn't mean he's changed his mind. He's still a God of justice. It means he's extended his mercy to a little greater degree. This also tells us something about God. He is wholly different in nature than natural humanity. This is important. God is different. There's an element of holiness and righteousness that we can appreciate, but we probably can't comprehend in its totality. And it's the filter through which he does everything he does. How about this one? Second Peter. Now, this is an accusation. I put this one in here because, because it, he, it gives us some of incredible attributes that you can rely on. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish. Who does God want to perish? Nobody. I know some people who teach doctrines, well, God wants some people to go to hell. No, I'm just telling you, it just says, read this right here. Instead, he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. Do you understand? I, I, this is what the word says. God doesn't want anyone to perish. I'm just going to say, whatever your doctrinal stance is on that, once you just line it up with this. Please consider that God really means this, that he doesn't want anyone to perish. But sometimes we choose to, even in the face of his mercy. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God desires that every single person repent? Yes. But Pastor Tom, yes. <laughs> so he's patient, he's intentional, he's merciful, and he's often misunderstood. In this book of Peter, he talks about how people in the last days will make accusations. And they'll say, where's the promise of his coming? You Christians have been saying every time there's a world war, every time something's going on, that this is the end and Jesus is coming back. And we've seen nothing yet. So Peter wrote about that. And we still do the same thing. 2024 is here. Y'all remember Y2K? Anybody remember Y2K? Y2K was the end of the world. Jesus is coming back on, on January 1st, 20... I've got to tell you something I did. It was terrible. I don't know if I've ever, ever shared this publicly. Have we got a minute? No, time's up. I'm going to share it anyway. So it was Y2K, and for some of you people who are young and don't know this, the whole grid was about to shut down. Nobody knew what would happen because when they invented computers, they didn't know what... Some of you old people, how many know what I'm... Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any Y2K, it was everywhere. It's a brave new world. We're going to go back to eating out of pans and making, uh, anyway, uh, clay pots. So we're doing the countdown. My family is all in the house. And my brother and I slipped outside. And we stood by the fuse box. <laughs> Three, two, one. And we shut the power. How many times do you get that chance, right? <laughs> you say, Pastor Tony, what kind of person are you? I am an opportunist, and this was a great, you wish you would have done it. You wish you would have done it. <laughs> anyway, dead silence. Oh, my God. <laughs> a few minutes later, Annie, Mark's wife, looks outside and goes, hey, the street lights are on. <laughs> Oh, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Let's, let, 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 me, let me make my point. Let me see if I can turn that into something that actually ends a message. Where was I? Anyway, we're often misunderstood. And sometimes some of our, some of our misunderstandings, we start talking about prematurely. And, and we don't really know what we're talking about. We just share what we've heard, not what we know. And we can get called up in this. And, and he says, look, he says, people are going to make the accusation that Christ has been coming back forever. Y'all have been saying this, but our fathers and their fathers, they've all fallen asleep and we've not seen this. This is what they say is going to be happening. And, and guys, there's a good chance there's going to be a war. And the last one, Hitler was the Antichrist. You understand that? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Stop it. 
Stop running around trying to, trying to cram everything into your theology. And you just get full of the Holy Ghost. You get full of the Word of God, and it'll insulate you from the foolishness of, of being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and every bad circumstance that happens. Let me give you a little, can I give you a little something. Nations rise and nations fall. America rose, and for a season it glorified God. If it turns its back on God, it'll become another example in human history of what happens when a nation walks away from God. Stand if you're able. As I, I know we've talked about a lot of stuff, but the most important thing is what you do with Jesus. I'm going to ask a question to you right now, and this is a question that only you can answer, and every single person in here can answer this question. I'm telling you right now, that there will, become, there will come a day when you alone stand before the sovereign king of the universe. And he will either say, I know you or I don't know you. All of your eternity from that, move, from that moment forward will rest upon your answer that he already knows concerning that question. Jesus is going to say, I know you, or I never knew you. And every one of us right now in our hearts, our heart is either saying, Jesus, I know you, or your heart is screaming right now, I don't know you. There's nowhere to hide from that. I'm begging you, for just a moment, consider the state of your soul. Because you will never be able to say, I didn't know, I didn't hear. The judgment, the just judgment of God is coming on every single one of us, regardless of what happens in this world. It is appointed to every man once to die, and then the judgment. Do you know the Son? Because without Him, the Father is dead to you. If Jesus is not God to anybody, there is no God without him to us. No man comes to the Father except by the Son. Do you know Jesus? Why? Because Jesus is the only person that ever paid your penalty. He's the only person that you can ever put your hope and your trust in. He's the only person that can ever bring you before the Father with a clean, with a clean slate. If you say this morning that I don't know him, I never want to hear these words, and I never want anybody here to hear these words, depart from me, I never knew you. If you don't know him, and you are willing to repent, and turn from your sins and ask God to forgive you, he says, if you will believe, Put your hope and trust in Him. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just you, but you and your children and your children's children. If you've not received that eternal life, evidence through the power of the Spirit and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in us, you can have that today. Or you can walk away. God loves you and will honor you to that degree, but you know right now, He's begging you. He's asking you, please, repent. If you're here today and you say, I know that he don't know me. And you know, I know that I don't know him. I know about him, but if I stood before him, he, I hope he knows me. If you want to know him and you're willing to say today, God, forgive me and save me, he is willing to. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but he said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my, my father and his angels. Listen, if you want to know him and you don't know him, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment, and I'm going to pray with you, and, 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 and Jesus is going to take the wheel from that point. All right, I, I don't want to turn this into anything it's not supposed to be. I'm not trying to turn this into something emotional, although it can be emotional. It's a reality, and it's a truth. I'm telling you, what the Word of God says as His ambassador here. If you do not have Jesus, you will pay the full brunt of the penalty of your sins. I'm begging you, please accept, repent, 
and turn to Jesus with all your heart. If you don't know him and you want to know him and you're willing to make that decision, it is not an emotion, it is not a feeling, it is a decision to accept what he did on that hill on that day in time and space. If you want to accept Jesus today, if you will raise your hands, we want to give you some information and I want to pray with you. If you're here, raise your hand and raise them high. Guys, look around, I can't see. I'm as blind as a bat with all these lights in my eyes. Anybody? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? This is just, this is it's just, it's, as Dragnet would say, this is the facts, just the facts. I'm giving it to you. Jesus is the bread of life that came down from heaven. Let's pray. Father, Jesus, you said it is your will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God, I believe you. I believe that it is the power and the truth of your word, the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that you have decided to release that power in the human heart. Holy Spirit, the living God, Jesus, I'm asking you, those right now who say, I want to know you and I want to receive you, I'm asking you right now in the name of Jesus Christ to come into their lives, to grant them, Father God, repentance, to give them the grace to put their hope and their trust those of you who raised your hands, those of you who are asking for help, just ask. Just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, save me. Father, save me in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, I thank you for this day, for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and your truth. Guide us in this day of deception. Arm us well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you need prayer for anything, physical, mental, emotional, there'll be people up here to pray with you. God bless you. We're on class number four in starting point. See you Wednesday night.